Welcome to Ali Fitness Podcast, a weekly production all about bringing health into fitness. In Daryl Edwards' past life, he spent two decades of working as a technologist in investment banking and suffering from chronic lifestyle disease. Today, Daryl is a movement coach, natural lifestyle educator, nutritionist, author, and creator of the Primal Play Method. Daryl developed the Primal Play Methodology to inspire others to make activity fun while getting healthier, fitter, and stronger in the process. Daryl, thanks for inventing that, and thanks for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks so much for the invitation. Excellent. Look, it was very impressive to meet you at Paleo FX and I knew always where you'd be on the grass rolling around, but I couldn't even hardly get to talk to you because you're just too busy uh, inspiring everyone to play. Yeah, it's definitely not the time to catch up with me at Paleo (laughs) FX because I'm kind of back-to-back workshops, I'm speaking, I'm encouraging people to have joy with movement. So you hit a nail on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you come across this joy with movement and why did you go from investment banking to the guy with no shoes who rolls around on the ground? In my previous career, I was very serious for one. My career was all about, it was a meritocracy. The harder you worked, the more you got paid. So it was very lucrative work, highly stressful. And so everything about that was very, very serious. The downsides were I suffered from kind of early onset of what I presumed to be the disease of aging. I was very hypertensive, high blood pressure. I was pre-diabetic and I also was a high risk of cardiovascular disease. So the recommendation by my doctor at the time was to take statins for the high cholesterol, to take beta blockers for my high blood pressure and to take metformin to manage my blood glucose because of my pre-diabetes. And the one thing I remembered at that time was that physical activity was a great way to reduce blood pressure. So I thought, well, why don't I give that a try and see if that will work, if that will help out. So I did that. I joined a gym. I started exercising and my blood pressure started coming down. That was obviously a tick in the box. And then I started, you know, doing more research and found out that exercise could also help with managing blood sugar, can prevent diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Within a short space of time, my numbers started to normalize without the use of drugs, without the use of any other intervention apart from physical activity. So that was when I decided there is so much that I can do through lifestyle. Let me investigate other areas. So, you know, I cut back on alcohol. I decided to think about what I should be doing in terms of nutrition to support the physical activity. And 15 years on from there has led me to where I am now where I kind of play for a living rather than working hard. So that realization came about when after taking my previous work ethic into the gym, remaining highly competitive, wanting just to beat anyone who came in my way, (laughs) you know, being number one on the leaderboard, that seemed to be what was driving my passion for physical activity, was being the best, being highly competitive, was thinking about performance, was thinking about the sport of fitness, That was my initial gravitas was around that. But then I realized it wasn't something that I could maintain physically because I was increased risk of injury predominantly. And secondly, I was only enjoying the end result, the goal. I wasn't enjoying the process at all. So I'd start skipping gym sessions. You know, I couldn't motivate myself if I didn't enjoy the activity. I was like, oh, I don't really like training for X. So I won't do that. I'll skip that workout. And the eureka moment was, how am I going to do this for the rest of my life? When was the last time I really loved movement and loved the process of movement? And that was when I was a kid. That was when I wasn't exercising. It was when I was playing outside with my mates and we spent hours and hours on end getting up to mischief, <laughs> you know, exploring the world around us. And that's what I wanted to recapture as an adult. That's what I wanted to recapture and develop that playful self again, to reconnect with my inner child once again, to remember what it was like reclaiming that joy of movement that I experienced as a kid. How could I reclaim that as an adult? And that's how Primal Play came about. It was taking that kind of hard work ethic and turning it into a serious play ethic and kind of rolling back from the goal-based orientation to a process-based orientation, enjoying the journey. 
So that's what's led me to where I am today with Primal Play and teaching people how they can reconnect with their inner child and how they can have joy with movement and find opportunities for movement. And then you're more likely to want to continue doing it until the end of your days. It's interesting. And your scenario actually doesn't sound that much different to a lot of people I know, at least the first part of it. The part where you go to the doctor and you're told that you're pre-diabetic and that you need to go on statins and what have you. The difference, I guess, is how you went about it. I can tell by your personality that that competitiveness in the gym would have been a good driving factor for you. What would you suggest to someone? A lot of our listeners probably know someone exactly like that, if not themselves. Let's say they're not so motivated necessarily with exercise. Do you have any little tips that you could actually share with us that we could help someone in that situation? I mean, I suppose you've got to find something that you enjoy. You know, you've got to ask yourself what your reasons are for spending whatever amount of time it is doing something that you enjoy. Because oftentimes exercise is selected as a hobby. It's selected as something that you do when you get all of the serious stuff out of the way. You get your work out of the way, then you can spend some time in the gym or outdoors doing some movement because you want to be healthy. You want to get into shape, whatever your motivations are. And I would say if your motivation starting point is, let me find something with movement that I enjoy doing, then you're not thinking necessarily about getting into shape, about achieving particular objectives or goals. You're much more considering what it takes for you to just have a great time with movement. And then all of that other stuff will be a side benefit. You know, you will get fitter, you will get healthier, you will get stronger and faster, you will improve your coordination, agility and balance. That will happen as a byproduct of you experiencing movement in this joyful way. You've got to find joy in your practice. You've got to find something that's going to take you out of your comfort zone, even though it's joyful. It also has to challenge you because that's the only way you're going to have an adaptation to that physical stressor. So something challenging, something joyful, and then finally something which is part of your, our inner nature, part of our DNA. You know, what sort of movement patterns should we be engaging in that will maintain our health, will maintain our youthfulness and exuberance? So those are the three things that I would focus on. I would ask anyone to focus on whether they're competitive or not, whether they have a love for sport or fitness, or would rather stay on the couch all day, right? Whatever type of individual are, if you seek joy and joy for movement, that should be the prime motivator for anyone. So what did the process look like for you as you started to discover and I guess start to enjoy the process? You stopped going to the gym and you went outside or what did you do? Yeah, I stopped going to the gym. I was actually doing a certification program with Jim Jones. So that they are Jim Jones or Mark Twight, who was the founder of Jim Jones. He trained the actors in the movie 300. His gym continues to train lots of stuntmen and actors and elite athletes to train in this very general preparedness way, but achieve remarkable objectives, remarkable goals within this broad pattern of movement. And I remember going through that process and I was like, again, getting really high up on the leaderboard, getting extremely fit and capable, I believed. But there was something missing. I was kind of bored. If I was second place, I was beating myself up. Even though I might be second place to somebody who's a national level athlete, you know, elite level athlete, and I'd get second and I'd be like, why am I not better than this person? You know, <laughs> I remember saying to them, you know what, I'd rather spend more time outside playing. You know, this is all a bit too serious. This is all a bit too important. There's too much sort of level of importance here. And I'm not really having any fun anymore. And I remember thinking, am I going to regret saying this? You know, hmm. am I going to regret not being with a peer group that are constantly pushing you to be your best to excel in terms of performance? But it was one of the best decisions I made for myself personally, because I did go outside. I was getting more vitamin D. I was starting to experience differences in temperature regulation. You know, I wasn't just training when it was nice outside. I wasn't just training when the environment was comfortable. I was training in environments which were quite rugged and, you know, I'd be wearing minimalist shoes or going barefoot. I'd be climbing trees rather than a nice, shiny pull-up bar. I was looking at the world around me as my gym. So that was probably the second eureka moment. The first was deciding, okay, I want to play more. I want to play out rather than work out was the first step. The second was, if I'm not going to go to a gym anymore, if I'm not going to be seeing four walls as my main movement space, 
and I'm going to be going outside and let's say I go to my local park, then maybe the world around me should be my gym. The environment around me should be my gym. And if I can't go outside for whatever reason, I need to consider my living room as my gym. Whatever my environment is, wherever I'm at, I need to stop making excuses based on it isn't the ideal environment for me. So that was the second kind of eureka moment that wherever I'm at, whatever environment that I'm in, that's my gymnasium. And the third was realizing that some of my work can be done in isolation, but it's also even far better to play with other people in cooperation, jointly, or within a group setting. That's also one of the most important aspects of play, being tactile, being in close proximity with others, and recognizing that you can achieve far more together than you can individually. I suppose that's kind of given us a nice summary as to the development of primal play from the kind of humble beginnings of realizing I just want to play out more <laughs> than, than work out right through to developing this methodology around how can I get primal instinctive movement patterns which we need to engage in, but use play as a way to disguise the difficulties of that and the challenges of that to make it more accessible. So tell me a bit more about the movement patterns. How did you decide the bear crawl needs to be one of the patterns or, you know, like the waiter's walk? I mean, clearly you mm. didn't actually make necessarily these moves up. How did yes. you compile them and then how did you go about patenting that method? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I think King Solomon said that there's nothing new under the sun, right, in Ecclesiastes. I'm kind of quoting the Bible, but I'm not religious. But pretty much everyone knows that expression. There's nothing new under the sun. And so I suppose in terms of my experiences, I mean, I'm known as the fitness explorer because part of my journey was to expose myself to as many different fitness methods and paradigms as possible. You know, I was excited about this exploration. So initially that exploration was kind of gym-based. Then my influences became one of, okay, let's try parkour for a while. Let's experience different types of martial arts. Let's look at other systems of natural movement. I kind of exposed myself to lots of different methodologies. I then came to a realization that what I felt was missing is what I wanted to be able to provide. Where I felt there was quite a lot of elitism in a lot of systems, I wanted to roll back from that. You know, I wanted to kind of say, you know, I want to focus on something which is broad and inclusive and general and not elitist. I want to be able to draw on all of my influences. And, and all of my influences weren't ones that I was exposed to much later in life. A lot of them, probably most of them, was actually when I was a child. I didn't really have to be introduced to a bear crawl as an adult because when I was a kid, I'd be mimicking all types of animals. My friends and I would be, you know, pretending to be tigers and leopards and cheetahs and elephants and horses and, and mm. frogs. And do you know what I mean? So we are systemizing these in some respects, but at the same time, they are universal movement patterns that we would have been exposed to as kids because we'd see the world around us, we'd read about the world around us, and we'd say, what would it be like to mimic a frog? Let's try these movement patterns. So I would say the greatest influence is inspiration was from childhood and then looking at what I was influenced by. So for example, in the 70s, I was exposed to lots of kung fu movies. My dad used to take me when I was very young, <laughs> probably too young, to overnight cinema on a Friday night. So he'd take us in the early hours of the morning, my brother and I, and we see these movies, which weren't really for kids, <laughs> but, but they were moving in animal forms, you know, Shaolin styles, fighting like monkeys and snakes. And all of this I absorbed at the time, but didn't really pay much attention to, but I was inspired by that. And so fast forwarding to today, I've taken on board all of those influences. I'm a big fan of magic. I was a magician for a while. So I take on board that, you know, the use of misdirection and psychology to get the best out of people to disguise some of the things that I do. You know, I'd say you can't really patent a bear crawl. We do crawl on all fours. That's a natural movement pattern. What I would say I do with Primer Play is taking those ingredients and making them more playful, making them more enticing, overlaying with a little bit of innocence and exploration that we had as kids. And in that way, those movement patterns are just a springboard for you to explore what you really should be getting up to. Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. so there are some moves that I have created that I haven't seen elsewhere that I've kind of adapted and said, oh, this would be a great way for me to be able to achieve this objective through movement. Or this would be a great way for me to have an icebreaker 
with my you know client for the first time or with a group for the first time this would be a great way for me to get a group in wheelchairs who have very limited mobility to be able to take part in my sessions even if they're elite athletes also in the same group yeah. you know how can i get both groups both parties to work together that's what I love about what you do. It's like if you're four or if you're 94, it doesn't matter. You've got an exercise. You've got a fun play movement pattern for them. Yes, yes, for sure. And it should be, you know, kind of infinitely scalable, right? You know, grandparents should be able to play with their grandchildren. And even if the grandparent doesn't have the same mobility as the grandchild, you kind of work it out, right? You work within your limitations. And so, it's, again, it's a natural for us to work in this way we don't have all the same abilities we don't have for all the same functional capacities why do we design systems that do tend to work within fairly tight constraints or they scale it in the way that it has no transferability to what you really want to do you know so it's like so different to that name of the movement pattern that you've given it that person may feel patronized they may feel as if it isn't relevant to them whereas i would say you should be able to pretty much scale it infinitely so people feel, regardless of their mobility restrictions, they're still taking part. They can still participate. They still feel, you know, it's an inclusive approach rather than an exclusive one. I mean, this is my criticism of probably the fitness industry, the wider fitness industry, is the marketing around fitness messaging. You know, who do you see on social media? Who do you see in the magazines? It tends to be a certain age, certain demographic, a certain type of body type. And if you don't fit that mold, you don't really feel as if you fit the part. And so your goal becomes, oh, I want to achieve APAC abs. You know, your goal becomes, I want to look great on the beach. And that becomes a lot of the drivers. You know, I want to be perfect at this particular movement pattern. I want to spend all my time working on my handstand balance because that's really cool. But, you know, that's at the expense of all the other stuff that you could be doing that would improve your quality of life, would improve your health and longevity. I feel that something like Primal Play is one antidote to some of the negatives that I see around conventional fitness. It's interesting too because what amazes me is, I want to ask you a bit of a personal question, when was the last time you did a gym workout? So you went in, you did bench press, like heavy squats. <laughs> I just have to say I can't remember when. I do go to gyms because I run workshops and sometimes my workshops will be in an indoor space as well as outdoors. And so I remember once, maybe several years ago now, I was challenged by a group that I was coaching and somebody says, oh, I've seen you playing around and rolling around and doing stuff like that, but I want to see what you're really capable of. And they challenged me to a one rep max deadlift. And I hadn't done a deadlift for years. It was something that I was training previously, but I hadn't done one for years. I hadn't lifted a bar or anything like that. For years, I've just started lifting people, you know, yeah. you know, lifting logs, pushing cars, that sort of stuff. But I hadn't done anything in the gym. I asked them, okay, you know, what's your challenge? What's your definition of strength? And they said, the deadlift is the expression of strength. And I said, okay, don't tell me what's on the bar. Get the longest bar you've got. That a seven foot Olympic bar. And I said, just put as much weight as you want on and I'll try it. I'll give it a try. If I can lift it, great. If I can't, I can't. And so I didn't know what I was lifting, but I was able to lift it. There was no space left on the bar. And it was about 550 pounds deadlift. Wow. And I'm not necessarily built for deadlift, long arms, long legs. But I was able to lift it without a warm-up. I was able to set it back down so I didn't just drop it because it probably would have went through the floor. And they were kind of like, oh, my goodness, you must be training deadlifts. Like, And they asked me what my previous one rep max was. And it was around 425 pounds the last time I was training. And that's when I was training deadlifts and I was training to improve my one rep max. So I went from that, fast forward a few years on, of just playing around to hitting a really high, you know, like, yeah, 550 pound deadlift. And I felt good about it. I felt like, yeah, if there was more space, I reckon I could do a bit more. So that was another light bulb moment for me. That's impressive. Did you ask yeah. them to do a duck walk for you after that? <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? They did ask me a little bit more about what I was doing to be strong and some of the methods that I used. You know, there's a high degree of transfer, but I, if you've seen some of my videos, I do things like tug of wars and I do things like shoulder barge where you're literally just trying to push somebody, you know, from a static position. Those are techniques that I use actually for kind of dynamic tension to improve strength. We just started playing some of those games. I'd be getting some huge guys, you know, like twice as wide as me, you know, a foot taller than I, 
And we'd be doing some of these games and they'd be expecting to win easily a one-on-one tug of war and I'd beat them. And when I tell them that I don't train to become stronger at the tug of war, you know, I don't spend my time thinking, okay, I just get stronger at this because one day I'm going to face somebody who's going to be really strong and I need to beat them. I'm like, this is just part of my training and I do it once in a blue moon because I'm playing with my group, not because I want to get better at it necessarily. But this kind of concept to them was alien because everything they did was programmed to train them along a particular pathway. You know, there was a progression that they had to follow. They had to, you know, increase their volume, increase the intensity, you know, make notes of the number of sets and reps. And my approach is far more kind of organic and I suppose non-linear. I won a few converts that day <laughs> based, based on the lift, but what I was telling them what to do was not do more deadlifts. It was probably to say, okay, if you're going to deadlift, maybe try lifting different objects, you know, and try lifting somebody who's half of your one rep max off the ground and see how you get on. You know, if you can't pick up your friend off the floor who's injured and they weigh a, a half of your one rep max, how useful is that one rep max deadlift with an Olympic bar if you can't functionally pick your friend up? So those are the types of kind of mm. questions that I, that I would pose. Sure. And I suppose that's what piques their interest. And that, get, that I, definitely piques mine. I guess in argument for their case, they may be doing an Olympic sport or something like that. And so, yes, it doesn't have functional everyday use, but then again, nor does table tennis. And yes, that's, yes. that's a sport. <laughs> what interests me is the crossover that clearly shows you're definitely stronger and faster than most people that I've ever met. I saw you on a stationary bike the other day on social media. Is it true that you came first, beat the second place cyclist and, yes. and got over a <laughs> thousand in power? How does, I guess, that transfer? I don't know. <laughs> I suppose I do know. I mean, I saw these kind of a competition going. I was giving a presentation at this event. And so I saw these people doing this kind of max power test on this bike. And I was asked to do the test. And I was like, one, I'm not dressed for it. Two, I haven't been on a bike for years, like a long, long time. And even then, it was one of those, you know, commute free bikes you get in the cities that you can hire, you know, those kind of commuter bikes. So it's not even a proper bike, really. So that was the last time I rode a bike. And I was like, mm, not really sure, but I'll give it a try. And so I wouldn't know what was a good number to attain. I had a look at the board. It didn't really mean anything to me. But they just said, just give it 100%, go flat out. So I attempted it and I got first place. And so, you know, people were asking me, oh, so what do you cycle? Have you had a history of cycling? No, no, no. What sort of sports do you play? Are you like an athlete or background in track? Like, no, I was a geek. I was a nerd. You know, I didn't have a gift in athleticism at all. I had a gift in programming computers. That's what my gift was. I was just as amazed as people who were running hosting this and then when i asked the previous leader on the leaderboard I was like okay how old are you you know and he's literally half my age and he was a cyclist <laughs> he was a cyclist i was like well that's pretty impressive so there is some transfer i suppose i am focusing on power you know i am jumping a lot i do sprints i do games that involve power the use of power and speed as i say i don't make the decision of saying okay i'm going to focus on power today Let's train power. It's just a natural byproduct. And why I train in that way is because I recognize that power and speed are two of the things that we significantly lose as we age, Mm. as we get older. If there was going to be a focus, it's ensuring that I am working on those components of fitness. Like strength is another one. I mean, I think with your knowledge, subconsciously, you would be focusing on that because you you know the importance of it. But what interests me is would an athlete perhaps benefit from, let's say, a triathlete taking Mm. a certain amount of time off or just incorporating a certain amount of primal play days. In your sort of anecdotal evidence-based research, would you say that an athlete would get dramatic benefits? I would say yes. I mean, whether it's because of, you know, just to improve their motivation, you know, just giving them something else to do to kind of pique their interest, for one. I'd say it probably makes them more robust because they're more likely to reduce repetitive stress. They're likely to spit repetitive stress injuries because they're going to be working other muscles. You know, they're going to be working other parts of the body that are probably neglected because they're focusing on specialization. So those would be two areas. And also, 
I think when you're not focusing on, you know, numbers and metrics and you're focusing more on the experience, the body and the mind being more mindful and being more engaged can often achieve more in that state. So I would argue there are benefits. And, and oftentimes I have had the fortune of training with people who are elite, you know, very, very high level athletes who will train with me. And they're often stunned at playing some of my games, which do appear to be just, oh yeah, this is a little bit of fun. But of course for them, it's really serious, right? They want to win. That's their, mm. that's their default position. And they'll be surprised that they don't perform that well at some of these tasks, which are fairly fundamental, right? So that's, again, I think is a reason why even elite athletes should focus on a little bit of general preparedness, whether it's primal play, whether it's another form. But I feel humans at heart are generalists of movement, not specialists. Just to add to that, because I believe we're generalists of movement, there are more benefits for us to train in this general way that will exploit our natural capabilities rather than this one-dimensional approach. And I understand, of course, if I'm an elite athlete, I have to spend most of my time in a particular domain to be the best at what I am. You know, for most humans, we don't need to train like elite athletes. We need to train like humans. You know, we need to be as humans are in terms of this general preparedness, jack of all trades, master of none, is healthier for us than specialization oftentimes. Awesome. So what step would I take then if I want to start getting into primal play? Admittedly, I can't pop over to your house in the UK. Would you recommend your online course, grabbing a book? Yeah. So I mean, first place would be to head along to my website, primalplay.com. That has some really good theory as well as practical hints and tips as to what you can do and to find out why movement of this nature is beneficial and helpful in terms of some of the underlying science, why play theory is beneficial, why play can be more serious than work, why play can actually achieve more results than work. There's lots of research out there on play kind of psychology. And thirdly, for those who want to take it a little bit more seriously, I do have books such as Animal Moves, my latest book, and I have online courses for people who want even more instruction to take them through kind of video instruction. And I also do consultations as well. A lot of my clients aren't London-based. I have people who I will consult with on Skype and kind of take them through this for people who really want to get serious about this. It's a learning experience, I would say, for myself too, because when I started doing this, I was expecting there to be a significant hit in comparison to my previous levels of fitness. You know, when I was training hard in the gym, by me playing, I was expecting there to be a significant drop-off in all mm. of those previous areas. But I found that actually I've maintained, if not improved, my abilities across the board. You know, so for example, I don't do any endurance work at all, really, apart from walking. But, you know, one of my clients do endurance events. And so I'm teaching them running techniques. And part of the session might be, let's do a 10K together. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I haven't done a 10K for like 15 years. I have no idea if I can do it or not. And I'll be able to keep pace with them. <laughs> you know, probably couldn't go any further. But the fact that I can hold my own, even though I haven't trained in that way for a significant period of time, that's the proof of the pudding to me. Or more to the point, you did it the whole 10K in bear crawl, which was pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that would be impressive. That would be. <laughs> so, Daryl, I appreciate that. And I'm going to put all of those in the show notes. And I really want to also pick your brain around a few other areas because chronic disease is something that you know a lot about. You've experienced it yourself. And mm. I know you recently spoke at the Breast Cancer Prevention in London, and you also have so much experience with MS. You talked a bit about the five lifestyle risk factors. Can you share a bit about what you sort of think they are, how we can prevent them through, I guess, movement and other things? Okay. So for breast cancer, I mean, there's lots of research in terms of breast cancer prevention, what the risk factors, top five risk factors are. And so one of them is physical activity. The second is diet, poor diet. The third is alcohol consumption. The fourth is hormones, endogenous hormones like estrogen, for example. If we have increased levels of estrogen, that increases the risk. So if you're taking things like the contraceptive pill, if you're taking hormone replacement therapy, that also increases risk. And then finally, you have the artificial kind of hormone disruptors, such as, you know, plastics, certain plastics, 
parabens, bisphenol A, for example, they can also elevate the levels of estrogen or artificial estrogen or kind of estrogen-like products in the body. And those five factors are the predominant risk factors for breast cancer, especially estrogen expression or hormonally expressed breast cancers. So those top five tips wouldn't necessarily be applicable for other types of breast cancer even, or even other types of cancer. But breast cancer is one of the areas that I focus on and I'm the most familiar with in terms of breast cancer prevention. But there's also very interesting work now on exercise and physical activity for treatment of breast cancer in combination with other conventional therapies. So there are recommendations in certain countries around the world now where physical activity is actually one of the treatment pathways for certain types of cancer and there's significant improvements in terms of success. So reduction in mortality, extensions of staying in remission, reduction of secondary cancer risk by somebody who's more physically active post-diagnosis than somebody who remains sedentary, say. So my interest goes even further covering other chronic lifestyle disease. I'm passionate about finding out why is exercise so beneficial? We've heard this message for years now, for decades, saying how exercise is really important at preventing disease, at reducing the risk of disease. It can help you if you have a certain condition. It can help reduce the severity of symptoms of those disease. Why is that the case? So I understand the science now as to why the physiological impact, the benefits of physical activity and what it does to the body and how it promotes healing and reduces inflammation in the body how it can actually have an impact on areas that we would only assume to be food. For example, there are improvements in the gut microbiome. So you can have greater diversity and volume of beneficial bacteria in the gut if you're more physically active than somebody who's inactive. And that's independent of diet. Two rugby players within the same team on a controlled diet, one with a higher VO2 max, so improvements in aerobic capacity, ability to process oxygen, as energy for movement. Somebody with a higher VO2 max, control for diet, same age and the like, will have more diversity of gut flora, more health-promoting bacteria in the gut. So there are so many areas that we're ignorant of when it comes to the benefits of physical activity. And it really fascinates me. I'm really excited at the fact that almost any area that I've looked at, I'm like, let's see if there's a connection between you know, the gut microbiome and cognitive decline as we get older. And of course, we know that it reduces your risk of dementia and Alzheimer's if you're physically active. And that association can occur from movement when you're a kid. So if you're very active as a kid, it reduces your risk of cognitive decline you know, from early onset, if you're middle-aged, right through to older adults you know, later in life. So very powerful poly pill, I would say. And for something like multiple sclerosis, which is also something I'm passionate about, and I have a lot of clients who have MS and are trying to do whatever they can to manage this disease, there are movement patterns that are quite potent. You know, they're almost like individualized prescriptions that you can adopt that can help you from a healing perspective. As we are becoming more familiar with food being medicine and food being beneficial for us or detrimental if we gravitate towards foods that aren't nourishing. I also believe it's exactly the same for movement. So movement can be beneficial if it's the right type and if it's healthful movement. And if we do too much, which a few of us do, too much of the same thing, you know, if we don't rest and recover enough, then it may become something which is detrimental. But to be honest with you, most people are on the sedentary side of the equation, not the doing too much side of the equation in terms of physical activity. Interesting. And have you found any sort of evidence as to what type of exercise for how long? Well, I suppose for the general population, the research tells us, and this is probably recommended by all government agencies, the World Health Organization, College of Sports Medicine, you name it, minimum of 150 minutes a week of aerobic activity, moderate intensity, and two days of resistance training. So resistance training being anything that, you know, you're supporting your body weight, that you're actually working against resistance, doing a movement that makes it much more difficult to do. That's a recommendation of the baseline of physical activity that we should be undertaking each week. So for aerobic, it should be at least 10 minutes at moderate intensity for it to qualify. And it should be moderate intensity, which means elevated heart rate, which means you're going to be a little bit getting out of breath. That's the bare minimum. So walking may not hit that, but a brisk walk may. 
for example. So would you say uh, would you say zone two for heart rate? If you were to oh, so you look at heart rate. So I mean, I'd probably say look at something like the Berg scale of the rate of perceived exertion. It's more useful because then if you don't have a heart rate monitor, you can still gauge what level you're at. So the Borg scale is from one to ten, and it's something that you assess yourself. So one would be sipping pina colada, um, you know, having a bunch of grapes fed to you. And a 10 would be an all-out sprint, say, you know, which you can't sustain for very long. And you gauge your level of activity on that basis. And something like a light jog or a brisk walk might be four or five out of 10. And then you would kind of use that as your gauge. An even simpler way than that tends to be the talk test. So if you can perform an activity and you can talk without getting out of breath, then that's usually just under moderate intensity. If you can't sing, you know, if you can't hold your note and you can't sing, that tends to be moderate intensity, that kind of five or six out of 10. For me, that's um, one out of 10. Yes, yeah, so for you, well, you're very, very conditioned. No, no, I just <laughs> but, can't sing. I've just got- <laughs> You can't sing? <laughs> well, that's me too, actually. <laughs> it's not to do with your singing talent. It's more to do with your sure. ability to, to be able to not require a breath before you can continue to sing. You know? Sure. If yeah, you so can't it- talk- Mm. If you're doing something and you're really struggling to talk, then that usually suggests it's vigorous intensity. And if you pretty much can't say anything at all, then it's usually high intensity protocol. Mm. So, or, or, yeah. So I use the sing, test, sing talk test. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Daryl, do you agree with that protocol? Which protocol? Sorry. Well, in terms of yeah. the 150 minutes and two times a oh. week of resistance training. Yes. I believe the general population should be aiming for that. I still don't think it's enough. That 150 minutes, two days of resistance training is what the evidence tells us that if you do at least that, you have a significant reduction in chronic lifestyle disease. You reduce your risk of you know, type 2 diabetes, of heart disease, of stroke, of several different types of cancer. You reduce the risk of all-cause mortality. So there's a 50% reduction in all causes of death if you meet that 150 minutes, two times a week of resistance training. But if you want to optimize that, it's actually around 350 minutes. 300 to 450 is the kind of sweet spot on the bell curve of aerobic activity. And if you do more intense activity, you can reduce that number by half. So if you spend a lot of time doing vigorous intensity activities, then you reduce that number by half. And if it's high intensity, it's even more significantly reduced because you don't need to spend too much time in terms of duration. So I would personally say, let's at least get to the 150 minutes first, <laughs> you know, mm. and two days a week of resistance then you can start thinking about what else can I be doing to improve my health. So I try to focus on what the evidence suggests, and I have a lot of that information on my website. So I don't want to just talk about opinions. There is significant evidence as to how much we should be doing and what types we should be doing. And in terms of how many people are hitting those numbers, I was in a conference yesterday in the UK, and there was a report written in relation to children. And so one in 10 children in the UK are meeting the recommendations for physical activity recommendations between 5 and 18. You should be doing 60 minutes a day. That's the recommendation for kids. Only 1 in 10 here are meeting that number. And it's pretty much the same in the rest of the developed world, unfortunately. And for adults, it's about 5% of adults are meeting the 30 minutes, 5 days a week, 150 minutes a week requirement. We really aren't doing enough. And even then, People who are hitting the 150 minutes aren't necessarily doing the resistance training or vice versa. They'll be in the gym hitting weights, but they aren't necessarily doing the aerobic work. So there's a lot we need to do. There's a lot of promotion we need to do to ensure people are aware of what they should be doing. Wow. And so when you say the statistics for children, did you say one in 10? One in 10. And they're just rounding it up probably. (laughs) And yeah, yes, they they probably are. It's almost a form of child abuse in my opinion. I mean, it sounds harsh, but. We, as adults of the last kind of generation or so, have allowed this to happen. Schools have cut down on playtime and recess. Parents are not concerned about their kids going outside to play. We want to drive our kids to school, even if they're just around the corner. When they come home from school, we want them to be in eyesight, indoors usually. They're on smartphones. They're watching TV. All of these things have happened in a relatively short space of time, in the last generation or so. I've got to mention two other stats mm. be- before I forget. So again, this is based on the UK, but modeled pretty much elsewhere in the Western world. 
75% of children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. That's another stat that I came across yesterday. And another one was looking at fitness levels of children from 1998. The unfittest kid from 1998, if he was put into a class today, would be in the top five fittest kids wow. in their peer group. Well, so, yeah. what's, in, what's interesting to me is I remember a couple of years ago, it was really all the rage to go and get your age tested, your fitness age, as opposed to your biological age. Mm. And people were sort of, you know, in their 30s and 40s and saying, hey, I've got a fitness age of 18. And I'm wondering if someone now tells me they've got a fitness age of 18, I think they're unfit. That's the thing, the kind of goalposts have moved significantly since then. And, and 1998, I mean, imagine if you went back another, you know, 20 years to 78 or to 68 or whatever. You know, imagine what the difference was then. So, yeah, it's pretty bleak you know, an outlook mm. for many of our kids who are going to become adults who are significantly deconditioned, who, you know, also have the additional complications of poor diet, probably sleep deprived, and all the other issues that we have in the modern era. I'm doing everything that I can to focus on what I feel is almost a poor relation, healthy lifestyle relation, which is exercise. So most of the time I'm having discussions about food, nutrition, nutrition is the kind of cure-all. And I kind of believe actually physical activity is significantly important and probably has more wider benefit than what we get from food. And the science tends to support that as well. So I'm like, yeah, we need people who are batting for this side, <laughs> for the side of movement and physical activity. And let's have discussions around this, which isn't just about what I can do you know, and look how good I look which is what we tend to focus on initially when it comes to movement. It's like, yeah, look how great and how sexy this person looks. Whereas actually, let's also start talking about how healthy you can become, how healthy you can be by partaking in a really good movement prescription. How can we reverse chronic disease? How can we reduce our risks? How can we maintain health if we are suffering from a particular condition? And you know, going back to the beginning of modern medicine with Hippocrates, doctors then they prescribed exercise. You know, when they wrote their scripts, they would suggest, you know, do 10 press-ups, you know, and, you know, like 15 times as part of your get well regimen. And I'm sure in the future, or I hope in the future, we'll start doing the same for lifestyle. You know, we'll say, okay, right, this should be a dietary prescription. This is what your movement prescription should be. And this is going to be helping you far more so than taking these pills, which will only mask the symptoms. That's why I feel positive and not so dystopian hmm. about, <laughs> about our present condition. I feel there are people who are championing this movement as medicine, this exercise as medicine approach. We're going to see more of this being discussed and communicated to the wider populace. Awesome. Look, Daryl, I really appreciate everything you've shared with us. Obviously, we're going to link to everything in the show notes. Is there anything else before I ask you one quick personal question that you'd like to share with us, perhaps that you haven't sort of mentioned or a tip or a bit of advice? I would say just find opportunities for more movement, which will challenge you. So, you know, for most of us, when we're told, you know, just walk a bit more, you know, just spend a bit more time, walk an additional bus stop, that sort of stuff. That's not really enough for us. You know, you should be doing stuff which gets you out of breath, you know, where you're really starved for oxygen, where you are feeling the effects of that hard, you know, effort, you know, for the following day. We should be engaging in those type of activities as well. Your body's learning to adapt to that stimulus because that's what's going to get you stronger. That's what's going to be improving your heart health, your lung health. That's what's going to be making you a more robust individual. So I would say, you know, find and seek out opportunities for more movement, which challenges you, not to the point where it's detrimental to you. Mm, that's a great point that you made right at the end there, the detrimental bit, because you want to challenge yourself, but you don't want to injure yourself. Yes, exactly. Exactly. You don't want to be beating yourself up keeping in a state of kind of chronically stressful state where it's harmful. You know, you want to be repairing and recovering. You want to be feeling that you're getting stronger and better and more capable, not just the fact that you're punishing yourself for, you know, having too many cream cakes last night, right? That's not the position you want to be in. You don't want to be neurotic about it. You don't want to be overly stressed about, am I doing the right thing or not? So mm -hmm. for most of us, if you seek these opportunities out, you're increasing the opportunities to move more, you know, for example, I'll give you an example of one of the things I did a couple of days ago. 
you know, I was on my way to the park to play around and there's a bus, you know, a hundred meters or so behind me, you know, at a fairly leisurely pace. I'm like, I'm going to sprint to the next bus stop. I'm going to see if I can beat the bus. And so I did a flat out sprint, probably about 300 meters or so. And I got to the bus stop and the bus actually stopped for me because he thought I was actually trying, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there were people kind of laughing, going, you know, be kind of like really out of breath. But it was like such a, an instant kind of rush of endorphins. It didn't take very long. It was probably about a minute duration. I went flat out and it felt really good. And that was almost like I could have said to myself, you know what? That was pretty much my workout for today, right? Yeah. Um, but then I went to the park and I just did some kind of leisurely stuff and balancing on railings and I climbed some trees. But that's how I got some very intense activity by using the world around me, mm. sprinting a bus. <laughs> but have we, have we just lost that? Because, you know, what you just said to me now is just something that I used to do as a kid all the time. Well, you know, we've all got this memory. You know, we need to kind of like plug ourselves back in to ourselves and say, what did I used to do as a kid when I wasn't so concerned about what people thought of me? When I was sprinting, I was really conscious of the fact there were a lot of people on that bus going, I hope he misses the bus, <laughs> right? I hope he falls over. Like, what's this guy doing? Why doesn't he wait for the next bus? Do you know what I mean? Like, I knew that was happening. But I was like, who cares? You know, I'm sprinting. That's it. That's all I'm doing. I'm having to make sure I don't run into somebody. I've got to make sure I don't trip over because I'm running flat out. But you become less concerned about other people and recognize that you are making a difference. There is somebody who's going to be watching you who's going, I want to do that too. Maybe I want to partner up with that person. Maybe I want to join a group of people who feel the same way and do this sort of stuff in the local park. So yeah, there are ways that you can you know, the wisdom of the crowd, so to speak, you know, you can find like-minded people where you don't feel concerned about doing a pull-up on a bus shelter and people <laughs> asking what you're doing, you know, or you're climbing a tree and people saying, you know, you're, you're harming the tree. Well, this tree's been dead for like 200 years, you know, like, I think the tree's okay, actually. That's but awesome. you realize that people want to be doing this stuff, but convention, you know, society tells them, no, that's mm. not what you should be doing now. You're an adult. And if you have young kids, then maybe that's an excuse to do more of that. But the pressure tends to be let your kids play and you sit on the bench with your smartphones or let somebody else coach your kids to move whilst you spectate. Mm. But your kids would rather you do it, to be honest. They'd rather mum and dad or uncles and aunts or a big brother, big sister, whatever it is, they'd rather you know their family and friends engage in those activities with them. That's mm. what they would ideally like. So we should be providing those opportunities to them and, and be less concerned about what the world around us thinks. That's a great last tip, Daryl. And just before I let you go, quick question. Do you have a tattoo? I don't. <laughs> short, short answer, no. Have you uh, considered it? I haven't. <laughs> I didn't know whether those glasses were real or not, but the I glasses should... are <laughs> right. Yeah, so they are prescription glasses. In terms of the tattoo, I'll probably have a better answer for that. I wrote a book in 2013 called Paleo Fitness. Part of the promotion of that was I had these amazing fake tattoos done on my forearms, paleo on one arm and fitness on the other. So people who've seen some of those photos which are on my social media would have assumed that I actually had tattoos. They looked fantastic. Even in person, people were like, oh my goodness, you've got these tats done. <laughs> but actually, they weren't real. And thank God for that. Yes. Yeah, for sure. I'll be walking around <laughs> with paleo fitness tattoos uh, for the rest of my days. So yeah, I haven't got any tattoos, but my glasses are real. Primal on one and play on the other may come in the future. That's, yeah. Well, that's something I'm probably more likely to ensure I'm going to be doing for the rest of my life. So being involved in this kind of primal, instinctive way to move and definitely being playful that's something I'm never going to give up. It's part of our DNA, so I'm going to continue to pursue that. Daryl, thanks again. It was a pleasure to have you on the show today. Thanks so much, Ali. It's been a real pleasure. For all the resources and show notes from today's episode, please go to www.ali.fitness. If you liked today's episode, please show your appreciation by going to iTunes, give us a five-star review, and subscribe. Thank you.